Welcome everyone. So today's topic for our lectures are going to be microbial environments, communities, and methods. So, so just a review from our energetics lecture, the foundation upon which from almost all energetics is built upon is the reduction potentials. So the idea being a reduction potential is a measure of the tendency of a chemical to acquire electrons or lose electrons and thereby be reduced or oxidized respectively. So basically, some chemicals want to give up electrons and others want to receive them. And since electrons want to move from donors to acceptors, the reaction, which we termed a redox reaction, gives off energy. Now, this energy that's given off can be used to do work. And in the case of our metabolisms, we're thinking about creating a proton gradient. Now, we, we talked about this tower in you know, a decent amount of depth last class where we can put these reduction potentials in, in order. This is our redox tower or our electron tower. So as we go from top to the bottom on the electron acceptor side, we're going from a bad electron acceptor to a great electron acceptor with oxygen being the best. Then we go from water at the bottom for a donor, as a really poor donor, I should say, to glucose, which is a fantastic electron donor. Now, the idea being here is you pair an electron acceptor with an electron donor. You look at the difference in the E values here, so these E naught values, and you can calculate how much energy you can physically get out from a chemical reaction. So let's, um, let's, let's just do a quick simplification of what we call an electron transport system. So this is how we get energy based upon using an electron donor and electron acceptor. So in the case of ours, so this is, would be respiration in the presence of oxygen, we start with a, our starting enzyme is NADH dehydrogenase or NDH1, and our ending point is cytochrome. So what ends up happening, so we have an energy molecule NADH, um, which is our electron donor here. It donates an electron to the dehydrogenase, becoming NAD. And then these electrons are passed down the chain to the cytochrome, and the cytochrome is um, not something, this jump isn't done in one step, it is done in multiple steps via a pool of electron um, acceptors called quinones. But ultimately it's passed to that final cytochrome. And then what the cytochrome does is it passes that electron to oxygen, which is our electron acceptor, creating oxygen, I'm sorry, creating water in the process. But along the way, we're generating a proton motive force. We're shuttling um, protons from one side of the membrane so on the cytoplasm here to the periplasmic space here. And so we can simplify um, and generalize this electron transport system for any number of organisms. So let's, let's, let's do just that. <clears throat> now, the idea being here is we have some sort of substrate-based oxidioreductase. A substrate comes in, donates the electrons. There's some form of intermediates here. And then we have it a terminal oxidioreductase and a terminal electron acceptor. And in this case, the reduced compound is the electron donor, which would be here. And the oxidized compound is going to be the electron acceptor. And that's just the general version here. We can look at ammonia oxidizing organisms. They take in ammonia and they convert that to nitrite. And their final electron acceptor is oxygen and they create water. Sulfate reduction. Um, again, you'll notice that the, the enzymes, so we have sulfite reductase and substrate oxidase, um, oxyreductase, so they do change the names. But we take an NADH or hydrogen for our electron donors, and our terminal electron receptor is going to be sulfate. It's actually a stepwise reduction from nitrate to nitrous oxide gas. And the final electron acceptor is going to be nitrous oxide, and we're producing nitrogen gas at the end. And this is, we discussed this last class, looking at what this looks like enzymatically um, over the course of the membrane. Now, those, that's just a refresher of some important metabolisms, how they work. But remember, it all starts with the electron donor and electron acceptor. And if you don't remember anything else from our metabolism lecture, just focus on this very, very simplified version of metabolism. You have electron donor, electron receptor, some immediates, and there's enzymes that carry the electron being donated by the electron donor 
all the way to the electron acceptor. Now, the electron acceptor can be oxygen, it can be nitrogen, it can be sulfur, it can be carbon, it can be any number of different things. So just keep that in the back of your mind if you don't want to remember all these crazy metabolisms. Now, in terms of um, what the questions we're going to be answering today is what environment factors influence microbes? What are the preferences and limits on my, where microbes can grow? And what is the terminology used to describe environmental preferences and requirements? And what are some adaptations that microbes use to handle environmental conditions? So in the, the sort of the dichotomy here is environment and habitat is not something that is exchangeable, right? So just get that out of your mind when you're talking about microbes and most organisms in general. The environment they live in is not equal to their habitat. The environment refers to the conditions in a place. So they're both living or biotic. So there's the organisms living there. And the abiotic, which includes the physical or chemical conditions, such as pH, temperature, salinity, things like that. Habitat, which again is different from the environment, refers to the physical place being inhabited by the microbes. And this needs to provide the necessities for life. Water, food, potentially shelter, protection from predators, and potentially access to mates. So Shelter and access to mates are in particular important things for our microorganisms, but they definitely are for you know bigger things that need to that need shelter and need to be able to mate. Now, the most important sort of determining factor of environmental microbiology is water. All life as we know it, no matter how big, no matter how small, needs water. So whenever you hear NASA talking about water on the moon or water on Mars and why it's such a big deal because water is the most important thing on this planet for life. About 70% of a cellular cell's weight is water. And that's true for you, and that's true for E. coli in your gut. And because water itself is required for both growth and metabolism, um, and all chemistry that is performed by microbes is what we call aqueous chemistry, or chemistry done in the presence of water. Water is particularly interesting because it affects the diffusion of gases. So gases in water typically diffuse or move from high concentrations to low concentrations, about 10,000 times slower in water than they do to air. And these are water, as you can imagine, when you have an aquatic environment like a pond or an ocean, water is easy to find. But when you start to go into drier environments like soils, it's more difficult. But ultimately, aqueous environments are necessary, even if it's only in a very small amount. Microbes can't exist in the absence of water. Nothing can. So even if you look at the driest soils in the world, like the Atacama Desert or the American Southwest or the Goji Desert in Asia or the Sahara in Africa, they might look super dry, but there's tiny pockets of water sustaining life there. Now, um, it's kind of cool. So a film of water, I love, this is one of my favorite um, figures to show people because it's, it's really wild. So we have water here, which is gray, and we have soil, which is black. Now, you can see these very two fine particles of soil. This is like very microscopic. Unfortunately, there's no scale here. Um, but you can see the film of water sticking to the soil. And the interesting thing about soil is that it actually attracts water. Now, as we go from the top here all the way down to the bottom here, we're going from wet to dry. But even under these very dry conditions, a very small amount of water still remains here and here, and even here as well. And it exists between the big particles and within the particles as well. And this little teeny tiny bits of water, even though the rest of it is dry, is still enough to sustain microbes. So microbes are always going where the water is. Now, another important characteristic of where microbes grow is temperature. So bacteria and archaea have larger temperature ranges than eukaryotes. So we know bacteria and archaea can be found in habitats down at low as 90, minus 90 degrees centigrade and all the way up to 121 degrees centigrade. Really, really big range. Now eukaryotes, their upper limit seems to be in the 50 degrees centigrade and their lower limit seems to be you know, about minus five. It just depends on the eukaryote. So, Kind of a crazy thing, right? Up below the boiling point of water and above the boiling point of water. So really crazy. Now, you might think if it's frozen or if it's boiling, how does metabolic activity exist? Well, the reality is that even, even when you have below the freezing point of water, liquids, liquid water still exists down to minus 20 degrees when you have very, very um, uh, salty conditions. And even at very hot 
temperatures such as those greater than the boiling point of water at 100 C, you still have liquid water due to the high pressures of the ocean. Um, so it is possible that, um, you know, it is possible that life can exist at these conditions that you wouldn't really think exists because water shouldn't exist at these very low temperatures or very high temperatures, but it does. Now, what life, what it seems to be, um, and what some people have suggested, is that the the upper and lower limits of Evaporated because of that. So, um, and as I mentioned, eukaryotes uh, don't do well at hot temperatures, but they do relatively well at low temperatures. So they can grow down into the sub-zero temperatures as well. Now, <clears throat> when we look at our microbes, we can classify them by different types. So we can look at files. And so microbes have an optimal growth temperature in which they grow. And so the word file, um, you've heard this in many um, examples, but uh, some of them not so good. <laughs> uh, it's just short uh, for the Greek for loving. Now we have four classes. We have psychrophiles, mesophiles, thermophiles, and hyperthermophiles. And as you'll notice that each of these has a nice bell-shaped curve. So psychrophiles grow less than 15 degrees centigrade. Mesophiles grow between 15 and 40. Thermophiles between 45 and 80. And hyperthermophiles greater than 80 degrees. Now, as a general rule, um, they have an optima. So most organisms have this bell-shaped curve where they grow fastest. So this is the growth rate on the y-axis. I neglected to mention that. But most organisms have this shape for the curve. They have one temperature that they grow really, really well at. And they still grow at other temperatures, but they don't do quite as well. They don't grow just as fast. And there's a number of different adaptations that exist to allow you to grow at these different temperatures. These include uh, adaptations to the structure of your lipids, the in introduction of hopanoids into your membranes, and finally, the formation of monolayers. Now, temperature is a really big deal. And it's not just a big deal for structures, but it, it has a huge amount to do with reaction rates. And there's this really interesting um, <clears throat> Uh, ex example we can give where we have temperature on the x-axis and the reaction rate on the y-axis. This is a log rate, so as you go down, the reaction rates are going faster. Uh, but what you'll notice is that this dotted line is that as it goes, well, as it goes down, you see that the, in the reaction rate is increasing. So as, 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 um, as, as the environment gets warmer, reaction rates, the way chemistry happens, just gets faster. And this curve is what we call the Arrhenius curve, if you want to Google it and learn more about it. But just to know, um, uh, you can physically look at temperature and microbes just move faster. They metabolize faster under higher temperatures. And you can actually measure this in real life. So you can look at the rates of denitrification and the temperatures in a rice paddy. And you can see they are directly correlated right, pretty well. As you increase temperature, you increase the rate of denitrification. So it actually works in real life. Now, next up is pH. And there are a number of different categories based upon preference. So we have acidophiles that like pH less than five, neutrophiles that like you know, more neutral pH between five and eight, and then alkophiles with actually pH greater than eight. And the sort of interesting thing is pH is pretty variable and different habitats can have very different pH levels. So for instance, most of the ocean, ocean has a pH of about eight. Lakes are typically between a pH of six and seven and um, geothermal or some mine drainage waters have pH of less than five. Soils themselves are typically acidic, but they can be alkaline as well. Now, what does pH do? Well, pH affects the solubility and charge of very important nutrients, um, including calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, iron, ammonia, different types of nitrates, things like that. So pH affects a lot. It doesn't just affect the direct biology, but it also affects the chemistry as well. And so we can actually physically look at this. We can look at the log of concentration over a pH scale. So we can look at iron, uh, you know, iron three plus, iron hydroxide, uh, and, and a couple other things too here. And you can see that as pH decreases, the amount of, uh, of these different iron compounds also decreases as well. I'm sorry, as the pH increases, the amount of these iron compounds 
con the amount of this iron decreases with it as well. So there is a relationship between the pH of environment and how much physical uh, nutrients are available for organisms. Now, um, <clears throat> salt concentrations are is an also important part, and salt concentrations themselves can vary wildly in the environment. So you can look at almost pure water or distilled water to up to the near saturation point of 35% salt. So salt varies widely. And some, some organisms get pretty heavily bummed out by salt. So in the lab, gram-negative organisms hate salt. So like your skin is relatively salty. Your, not very many grams positive, I'm sorry, gram-negative organisms live on your skin because it's salty. However, there are organisms such as halobacterium that love salt. So it's kind of a sort of a thing. Some love it, some hate it. But if you love it, you have to be adapted on, um, you have to be adapted to it. Um, if we were in lab, you would actually test this, um, which is kind of a fun thing, but unfortunately we're not going to test it in person, but you'll, you'll still do it. Um, and sort of an actually interesting thing is if you have a high enough salt, you can prevent most growth of microbes. So when, when you think about salted meat or salted fish, we salt it not for the flavor, but we salt it to preserve it. Now, you might ask yourself, how does salt kill microbes? It's not actually salt that kills the microbes. It's actually the water. Because remember, everything exists in an aqueous solution water. So this this general rule that water follows salt. Now what does this mean? Well what we're talking about is osmosis and osmotic balance. So when we have an isotonic solution where there's equal concentrations of say salt inside the cell and outside the cell, there's no net movement of water. Right? Now if we have a hypotonic solution where there's much more much higher concentrations of the solute outside of the cell versus inside the cell, um, I'm sorry, of vice, of vice versa. We have much higher concentrations inside the cell than outside the cell. So I'm looking at these big black things, not these little tiny black things. What ends up happening is water moves from the low concentration to the high concentration. So we have what's called the hypotonic solution. Now, if we have a hypertonic solution where there's more outside than inside, again, big black things, water moves from inside the cell to outside the cell. And so you can imagine in these two scenarios, if you have a hypotonic solution, if water is rushing into your cell, it could rupture your cell. Or if you have, you have a very hypertonic solution, you might, water might rush completely out of your cell, drying your cell out and thus killing you. So it's important to maintain osmotic balance and different microbes handle osmotic balance differently. It requires some adaptations to do it overall. Now, <clears throat> to survive, microbes have to physically raise their internal solute concentrations. And so what they do is they pump inorganic solutes such as calcium or make organic solutes such as glycerol. And the idea being is that these are called compatible solutes, which actually don't interfere with cellular function, but using them allows you to maintain osmotic pressure. So the idea being is if I have too much, say, calcium on the inside versus the outside or too much sodium on the inside versus the outside, I can balance those out by, pro by producing something like glycerol or another potassium ion. Um, <clears throat> so just as just way you can, microbes can produce these things to help mitigate really stressful conditions where, where osmotic balance occurs. And just as a note, uh, due to high osmotic pressure, um, honey actually is safe to eat essentially forever. So you can get honey that's 5,000 years old and still eat it. It's not due to salt, but it's actually due to the very high concentrations of sugar in honey and some antimicrobial properties. So we talked about salt, but high, 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 high osmotic pressure also works for other compounds such as sugars. Wouldn't really think it. Um, wouldn't really think it, but um, sugar can be a really good preservative. So next up is oxygen. Now, oxygen itself plays a key role in the metabolisms of many organisms. They act as a great terminal electron acceptor. It's required for almost all eukaryotic metabolisms, except for fermentation, and is required for some bacterial metabolisms that, you know, that are aerobic. Now, many bacteria and archaea do not require oxygen. These are anaerobes. They can be either obligate anaerobes, such as Clostridium tetani, which is the causative agent of tetanus, meaning they have to be in the absence of oxygen, or they can be facultative, such as E. coli, which means they will use oxygen if it's around, but if oxygen isn't around, they'll still be able to grow and do their thing. And then there's this weird class of, class of organisms that like a little bit of oxygen. 
And these are what we call micro error files. So for instance, streptococcus, which is found really commonly in the back of your throat, where there's very, very low oxygen, about 4% oxygen, they like a little bit of oxygen. Now, there are a couple of, of um, uh, key terms that we need to talk about. So we have oxic, which is let greater than 30% saturation. And then again, this is relative to the atmosphere. Hypoxic, which is one to 30% saturation. And anoxic, which is less than 1% saturation. Now, oxygen concentrations are affected by diffusion and mixing and the activity of oxygen producing photosynthetic organisms. But in general speaking, as you go deeper, whether it's in the ocean, whether it's in soil, whether it's in anything, even in your gut, as you go deeper in your, in your colon, um, oxygen decreases. And you can see that here, temperature decreases in this water column, uh, salinity you know, sort of increases a little bit, but not by much. Oxygen completely goes away at depth and comes back a little bit. But there is a relationship between depth and oxygen. And this happens not just at monstrous scales like this, you know, 500 meters. This also happens at sub millimeter scale. So this is some, actually some data from uh, a project I was working on in grad school where we looked at the penetration of oxygen in uh, soils. And as you can see, um, what we have is um, very, very shallow depths, millimeters. So three centimeters, three and a half centimeters here, and oxygen was disappearing very, very quickly. And again, oxygen penetration in environments like this is affected by water because if there's a lot of water, well, it just doesn't penetrate quite as deep. So next up is pressure. So high pressure environments represent the largest biome on the planet. So you're thinking about the bottom of the ocean, uh, deep, deep ocean and the deep subsurface of the planet. So you don't really think about this, but as you go deeper in the crust of the planet, pressure increases. And some microbes thrive in these conditions. There's microbes that live miles down in our planet and they live kilometers down at the bottom of the ocean. Now, microbes that like to grow at high pressures are called pyzophiles. Uh, Hyperpyzophiles grow at um, pressures greater than 60 megapascals. Just to put that in perspective, the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of our ocean, that's what's uh, seven miles down, has a pressure of 110 megapascals. So very deep, even at 60 megapascals. Now, um, we do think pyzophiles, so those high pressure loving organisms likely evolved from low pressure psychrophiles because there's a, all sorts of similar adaptations between people who like to live the cold, in the cold and people who like to live at high pressures because they use lots of unsaturated membrane lipids and very similar protein and DNA modifications. Now, what we talked about is no, is certainly not an exhaustive list of all the things that affect microbes. Um, there are many, many more. Some we're going to discuss, such as light and carbon and nutrients, and some we won't ever even know of or even consider. But before, so that's just sort of some the ways microbes exist. They're different preferences. Microbes, they're very specific. And you might think, well, why are they so specific? Well, think about you. You're very specific as well, right? You like a certain set of conditions. Everyone does. Microbes are the exact same way. Now, we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about being small. Because one of the things we talked about in the very first lecture is that being small is advantageous to being a microbe. And so how does being small matter? Well, the, one of the ways that being small matters is this idea of patchiness. And so we should ask ourselves, what's a homogeneous environment? And a homogeneous environment is just an environment that all the conditions at all points within the environment are exactly the same. So when you have a cup of water, the, the, the conditions at the top of the bottle of water and all throughout the bottle of water are essentially the same, which would mean that bottle of water is homogeneous. Now, a homogeneous environment does exist for macroscopic organisms, right? So for instance, the ocean at different habitats and conditions for the microbes. So that's aquatic system, but soils are very, very different at the sub-micron scale as well. Now, this patchiness helps support the large amount of microbial diversity in many, in many what we would consider seemingly homogeneous environments. And this is an idea we're going to revisit very, very shortly as well. And what do I mean by patchiness? So this is some soil, and we're looking at particles of soil. 
And you can imagine, well, this part of the soil molecule is different from this part. And that's on a microscopic scale. And certainly this part is going to be different than this part. And so there's all sorts of patchiness inside a very small area that we can't really see. When you pick up a scoop of dirt, you don't see this. You just see dirt. And you assume that's not very patchy. It just all looks like dirt. But at the molecular level, I'm sorry, the 